Good morning. This is Brighter Morning with Bo, and I am Bo Tiwari, and my guest this morning is Dr. James Hospitalis. So let's welcome Dr. Hospitalis. Good morning, Dr. Hospitalis. How are you? you good good morning, morning, Bo. Thanks for having me on the program. Yep, I'm good. Yeah, I, I, I hope that you can stay with us. I want to have a, a long conversation with you on this because this matter... Uh, is very bothersome to me. Um, we have this Omicron virus, which uh, we are learning about. And when I say learning about, is that it's a new mutation, and we don't really know what are its behavioral patterns and its impacts yet. Uh, we are now grouping, we're trying to find out about it. I, I, I wonder if I could begin by asking you with all your knowledge and experience from CAREC, from CAFA, uh, in your new role now as leader of Earth Medic, um, and as a, a, a really... A, a global, a knowledgeable person in the world system on public health and public health issues. Can you explain to the ordinary citizen what is happening here? Thanks, Bo. Uh, yeah, I have had decades of experience in this game, so I guess part of my role is to bring context to the situation that Trinidad and Tobago, the region and the world faces at this time. Um, first, I would say that COVID was predicted years ago or something like COVID. Uh, this is the 10th pandemic of the last 100 years, beginning with the Spanish flu in 1918, 1919. The rate at which pandemics have been occurring, if you look at the last 30 or so years, seems to be increasing. So the lesson is, and you mentioned it earlier in the program, there will be other pandemics to come. One of the reasons for that is that the forces that drive deadly pandemics are all aligned. But what do I mean by that? Well, there are four forces in particular that uh, driving us towards more deadly pandemics in the future. Number one is animal-human contact. You see, most of the pandemics that have come out in the last 30, 50 years have been due to contact between people and animals as we humans invade their territory, cut down forests, especially tropical forests, cut down and plow over wetlands for development or crops or what have you. And that brings people into closer contact with animals and viruses that are circulating in the animal population can jump to humans. And that's what happened with COVID as best we can tell. It originated in a bat, as have other diseases that uh, uh, originated in animals and spread. The second force driving us towards more deadly pandemics is international travel. International travel has been a, an amazing phenomenon going from you know, a, a few tens of millions when you and I were born. I want to ask you when you were born. Um, to 1.4 billion per year pre-COVID. And that means the possibility of distributing a new disease within a day or two from one part of the globe to another part of the globe is phenomenal. And that has a bearing on the Delta variant and the Omicron variant that we're now focused on. Because, and I'll come back to that, because by the time you realize there's a new one, whether it's in England or South Africa or somewhere else, it actually has spread much further and faster than you realize. And that's why WHO actually advises against knee-jerk travel bans, because they don't work. The horse is out of the barn already. Secondly, 
if the world responds like that all the time, then a country that discovers a new variant may be tempted to just keep it quiet because they're going to get punished if they declare it. So the automatic travel bans doesn't necessarily work in the favor, although it is understandable psychologically and it may be a popular thing to do, kick those people out, whoever those people are. But I really wonder if this had arisen in the Netherlands or if it had arisen in Canada, if the reaction would have been the same compared to it having been first de detected. We don't know where it arose, detected in South Africa. Is there a, a discriminatory uh, uh, flavor in that reaction? So I was mentioning the first factor is human-animal contact. Second factor is travel. The third factor is the population in the world today. Certainly the population in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean. Population is aging. Population has a lot of chronic health problems, which makes you vulnerable to the infections of COVID or other serious uh, viral diseases. We have a lot of overweight and obesity, diabetes, hypertension, uh, cancer. These things, uh, many of which are preventable, uh, are, have a softened up, if you will, for a virus like COVID when it comes. And finally, the fourth factor, which I have been focusing on the last couple of years, is climate change. Climate change is long-term change in weather patterns. Climate change is accompanied by warming of the planet. And people have been saying, you know, we've warmed just over one degree on average. So what does that matter? That doesn't sound like much. But to warm up by one degree, this whole planet, it took the equivalent, it is taking the equivalent of an atomic bomb going off every second for the last 25 years. Think about that. That's how much pressure we are putting on the whole planet. The knee, the knee of humanity is on the neck of the planet. And that extra heat drives the multiplication of viruses. It drives, it speeds up the multiplication of mosquitoes. And then they're better able to transmit things like dengue, chikungunya, and other vector-borne diseases. So that's why I say other pandemics like COVID are going to emerge. The four forces that are driving us towards more deadly pandemics are aligned. Human-animal contact, international travel, an aging unfit population, and climate change itself with the extra heat and the extreme weather that comes with that heat. The heat is in the oceans, and that drives the big hurricanes that have been murdering the people of the islands especially. But Trinidad and Tobago is not immune. We saw record floods here in 2018, 2019. And those cause outbreaks of leptospirosis. They cause people to be disrupted in their lives. They can't get their medicines. You have extra mortality, extra death. So this saying that God is a Trini, <laughs> I just laugh when I hear that. The world just concluded the COP26, as you would know, in Glasgow. Uh, con considering and coming to a new agreement about climate. But it, what, what was put down there is not sufficient to keep us out of deep trouble. We're already in trouble, but we're going to be in a lot more trouble if that those are the only ambitions that are followed through on. So I think I'd like to, you know, these first comments on context, uh, Put those out there, you mentioned this is a public health problem. There is an attendant economic problem, which in some countries is bigger than uh, bigger than the actual number of cases and deaths of COVID. And we're seeing more hunger. Countries that are unequal to begin with, that inequality is exacerbated. Uh, the United States is an example of a very rich country that has done a very poor job of controlling the virus. And it's the deadly epidemic there precisely because a lot of people don't have health insurance. They hand to mouth, as we say in Trinidad. And that economic aspect of it is also a terrific impact. And it's a behavioral issue, and we could talk more about that. Um, that, you know, you only get to a certain point when you're bullying people. 
Well, if you don't get vaccinated, we will do this, we will do that. I think we need to pause and seriously research why people don't want to get vaccinated and change from maybe vaccine hesitancy to vaccine inquiry because people are worried and that has to be addressed and we need more research on that. But I'll pause there uh, in terms of setting context about COVID in a historical context and we will have more epidemics and pandemics. Of that, I will bet. Okay. Um, now, of the four issues that you, you mentioned, uh, it's hard to do. Um, we can do some things, but it's hard to, to manage in short time the animal-human contact issue, which uh, fuels the transference. It's in, international travel. Uh, once we settle down with this Om Omicron is going to be back to normal, as you say, 1.4 billion people. And it is a major um, industry in the world. Um, then the aging population, that's a reality. You can't reverse that process. But the chronic diseases, we could deal with preventative health measures, I mean, I'm thinking about Trinidad and Tobago now and worldwide, but let's focus on Trinidad and Tobago. We could take a preventative approach to chronic diseases. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, starting in the home and in the school system, I think, and the climate change issues. I, like you, am disappointed with how uh, COP26 um, uh, panned out really because it started with a lot of hype and then basically you couldn't get people to agree to what was required to save the planet basically. Um, but uh, even there, there are things that we can do. But let us, let us talk a little bit now about this particular Omicron virus that we are now saddled with, uh, we hear you and we believe you that uh, pandemics are going to emerge uh, more and more frequently and that some of them are likely to be health pandemics, uh, either like this one or uh, with uh, variations on the theme, so to speak. Um, what is happening now with Omicron and the responses that we are getting worldwide? I mean, can we continue to operate with something like this, which is an unprecedented phenomenon in my view, for which the knowledge that we have is not sufficient? for which the experience that we have is valuable but does not really lead us to immediate solutions? And can we continue with this matter with countries acting to protect national populations or to at least be seen to be protecting national populations when this virus cannot really be contained globally. Could you comment on that? I am giving you that, these very broad questions because I don't like the way the discussion is going. I think that the discussion that is taking place globally is kind of dense, if you ask me, because it is too narrowly focused on uh, what is the immediate political concerns of people rather than on a public health response that is global in nature and that recognizes that we are dealing with these broad problems that you are dealing with. Not to mention the two big issues which are um, inequities in the world and the inequality of vaccine distribution 
and the vaccine resistance, which is real and has to be dealt with in every other, every single country. And these two factors really compound the situation with this new variant, Omicron. So I give you free reign to discuss that from any perspective or hitting on any things that you want to, because I know you can. Thank you, Bo. Um, well, I said part of what I'm here to do is context. Um, you know, when I was a medical student in the 70s, we used to get, I was in Jamaica and I was at the children's hospital and we used to get dozens of cases of malnutrition and pneumonia every day. And a big contributor to that was measles. Today, we don't have measles in the Caribbean. It was eliminated in 1991. And it was eliminated with well-planned, scientifically thought through programs of vaccination. Backed by laws, backed by public communication. Now we live in a different time. We have much more prevalent social media and misinformation and disinformation. But measles is even much more infectious than uh, uh, COVID. And we dealt with it by vaccination, education, proper scientifically based planning. The WHO and the Pan American Health coordinated. We at CAREC, where I was at the time, focused this thought and delivered, working with the countries, working with the immunization nurses and planning it out in great detail. We took three years in the planning of what was called the Big Bang and one month to deliver and vaccinated 92% of the population, one to 14 years of age in one month. And transmission of measles stopped. People from America and France came in 92 and 93 and said, how did you all do that? I've got to tell you, I felt good. When people from the CDC and people from the British uh, Communicable Disease Surveillance Center, as it was called at the time, were coming, and France were coming to us, says, how did you all do that? This is important context, Bo, to put forward as to part of the answer to the question with uh, how we go forward with COVID. The second thing I would say in terms of context is, remember, Omicron is just the latest variant. And as I said earlier about pandemics, there will be more pandemics, there will be more variants. That's right. So there needs to be a more measured and considered response to new variants arising instead of just the knee jerk. Oh, there's a new one. Oh, it'll stop people coming from there. Where, where is there again? Well, where do they find that? Come on. Because where it was found, there's a good chance that's not where it actually arose. And now we're learning that the Omicron variant was not only in South Africa or Africa, it's in the States, it's in Portugal, it's in Canada, it's in England. So what are we going to do, ban the whole world? Well, that's a possibility. You could shut completely down again. And some countries have stayed closed for a long time until only recently reopening. Vietnam, New Zealand, uh, among them. Unless you have done that very, very early in the game, before there's anything in your country, uh, it, it doesn't work. And that's why WHO advises against those automatic uh, knee-jerk travel bans. And as I said earlier, if that is what the world responds to when somebody declares, look, we think we have a new variant, it may not have arisen here, but we're detecting it, and they're punished, it leads to a tendency, well, look, we ain't going to tell anybody anything now because we just get lash when we tell people we have a new variant, which is an understandable psychology. The key, as you uh, said earlier, um, you know, I'll just go back to the earlier point I made about travel. Take the UK, where the prime minister there announced they're going to ban people from South Africa. Well, South Africa was having 500 people a day back and forth between London and Johannesburg and South Africa more broadly. So by the time the new virus was discovered and people said, oh, we're going to ban, the horse was already bolted. 
you're closing the barn afterwards. The, the, the future is, is going to have to be the vaccine or else we're in real trouble. And again, I go back to the example of measles and how that campaign was conducted to show that it is possible. We did it a long time ago, decades ago. We need generic vaccines. We need the manufacturers in the north to hand over the patents and the know-how to countries that have the capacity to scale up manufacturing in the south, South Africa, India, among others. And we need that yesterday. And that move, that policy decision at global level, that global solidarity will protect everybody, people in the south and people in the north. Or else Biden and Johnson and others will be forever thinking, oh my gosh, I need a new plan to combat this new variant. But the new variant is arising precisely because we haven't acted in global solidarity to stop something that they have the know-how and capability for. Now, people might say, well, oh, but those manufacturers put a lot of investment into these new vaccines, and therefore they should re re reap a reward on that. Well, come on, give me a break. Most of the investment came from public funds. That's right. Look at AstraZeneca. Look at many, all the other brands that are out there. Public money went to those companies to invest in the development of the new vaccines in the majority. The majority of the money and the majority of the vaccines. So the vaccines really belong to the public and the world. And I strongly believe that many, many people are dying for this vaccine in more, more ways than one, not just metaphorically speaking. And so the, there needs to be a, a, a waking up to this, that it is in everybody's interest, rich and poor, to start back the economy if that's what we want to do, to address this serious issue, to make vaccines available throughout the world on a much easier, uh, at a much easier way than we've been doing at the moment. So that issue of uh, 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 releasing the patents and the know-how, and I stress that because it's not just a patent. You've got to also explain to people who are going to be manufacturing it as a generic uh, vaccine the, the exact how it is done. These are new technologies, and uh, we've always developed new technologies because that gets us to the issue of hesitancy and people saying, oh, well, this is new. But we've always had, that's humankind. We make, we invent new things. We're innovative. So if you refuse something that's new, then you should be refusing a lot of other things in life. Um, but we'll get to that. Uh, so the point I really want to make here is the, the, New variants are going to keep emerging. Omicron is just the latest. As far as I can see and infer from the data, this is a very transmissible variant. But I don't think it's going to be super deadly, or else we would have known already. When a new disease emerges, there's a tendency over time for the virus to actually become less deadly. Because if it's very deadly, it's found out very early and it's more likely to be contained. Um, uh, uh, but COVID in general, it, it has a lot of asymptomatic cases, and that's what's special about it. Um, you have a very deadly effect on some, but for many, it is mild or asymptomatic. And the that mild and asymptomatic transmission phase is what puts the disease, uh, Tony Fauci said some years ago, that's his uh, nightmare. And he specified what the nightmare would look like. And one of aspects of the nightmare is that you have a lot of asymptomatic transmission, uh, but you also have the possibility to kill uh, certain people. So here in Trinidad and Tobago, four or six weeks ago, when the schools were partially reopened, and unvaccinated children were allowed to come with vaccinated, I thought, oh my God, that's it. We're going to have a big third wave because the asymptomatic transmission would occur in school and they would be taking it back to their homes, their parents, their grannies, their great-grannies, their great-grandfathers. Uh, 
So we have to get over that, and maybe we could we could talk about that subsequently. The vaccine hesitancy issue and some other issues around transmission that need to be stressed uh, here Jim, and elsewhere. James, I have to close this now to break for the news, but stay with me and we will continue this discussion. And what I'll do after the break when we come back is that we will deal with the question of the unvaccinated. Uh, first of all, whether that is a breeding ground for mutations, whether we've got to not just um, um, give the, the, the property rights issue over to countries so that you can have production uh, locally, but we've got to vaccinate as many people as possible and find a communication strategy to get the unvaccinated to vaccinate. And then I have some clips I want to share with you and I'll ask you to respond to them. Okay, but this is Brighter Morning with Bo. We are talking to Dr. James Hospitalis, leader of Earth Medic and a former director of CAREC and uh, CAFA, uh, a public health professional uh, who has operated in the Caribbean, in Trinidad and Tobago, and who is well respected globally. And when we come back, uh, as we break now for the news with Andrew Chan, we will deal with the question of vaccine hesitancy. Mm -hmm.